During the early days of the air war over Europe, it was a disaster. American bombers bravely flew into the skies of occupied Europe, only to fall in flames as battle-hardened Nazi pilots picked apart their crude formations with accurate gunfire. But experience counts, and in a few short months, the formations tightened, and the little friends, fighter escorts, appeared alongside, even the odds. How air war Europe went from devastation to victory is the subject of the programs presented herein. You will view both a synopsis of the aerial strategies as well as stories of the application of air power against Nazi Germany. Produced at the end of World War II, these official documentaries convey a perspective that modern documentaries simply cannot recreate. We present these programs without any editorial intervention whatsoever. Hermann Goering, on seeing the first American P-51 Mustang over Berlin, said the war was over. It was only a matter of time. Why that was true is presented in the following official productions. First, though, some still photography from Air War Europe. is an American air base in East Anglia, on the east coast of England. One of many such bases from which American fighter planes swarmed up into battle against the German Air Force. Planes known as the P-47, the Thunderbolt, a fast, tough, high-altitude fighter with a dive like its name and an eight-gun blast in its wings. The Lightning, the P-38, master of the air in many theaters of war with its long range and concentrated firepower. The Mustang, the P-51, the longest range fighter in the world. Speed, fast climb, quick dive, tight turn. Into these three great fighters, America poured its genius, its millions of man hours of labor, its faith in victory against the Luftwaffe. And in their single cockpits, it placed these men. Relaxing now, but not for long. At headquarters, 8th Air Force, General Doolittle is discussing fighter protection. The 8th Fighter Command will give fighter cover to targets and back from the target. Desirable that we peel off as many fighters as possible to come down east of the Roar, and straight ground targets. The bomber plan, timing, altitudes, strength, course, and targets reached the combat operations room at headquarters, 8th Fighter Command, Major General Kepner commanding. A field order goes out. 62nd Group P-47s will escort heavy bombers over enemy coast through target to limit of endurance. The machinery is set in motion. Now comes the briefing for the mission, and everybody present. These Thunderbolt pilots are veterans of many missions, so the colonel gives them only the ascensions. They are to escort the bombers to a target about 40 miles east of Mannheim, and then proceed to the strafing of airdromes north of Frankfurt. 
They're given times of takeoff, rendezvous, escort, strafing. The pilots make notes on the backs or palms of their left hands. Intelligence warns them that they may expect considerable enemy opposition today. The Germans have brought in some 100 single-engine fighters. On the field, planes warm up. It's takeoff time for the Thunderbolts. Time to the escort schedule, the P-38s get underway. And at still others, the long-range Mustangs go to keep their rendezvous with the bombers someplace deep in Germany. Somewhere out there over enemy territory, near or far, in the long route as the bombers go out and come home, each of these formations will make rendezvous at a certain point on the exact minute. The Thunderbolts climb steadily over the channel into hostile skies. Close to rendezvous. And in the distance are the bombers. Advanced formations of an armada perhaps a hundred miles long. The Thunderbolts maneuver for their escort position. Each pilot searches the sky constantly watching for the main enemy attack, which may come near the coast or deep in Germany, or hit and run sneak attacks by the enemy's aerial snipers. And then, at another rendezvous point, comes a group of Mustangs to relieve the Thunderbolts. This is Red Leader. All came in, it's time to break escort. Mustangs coming in at eight o'clock. The Thunderbolts break escort. They head for home, watching for every possible strafing target on the way. The Mustangs, far in the distance, sweep the surrounding sky as they come in to take the places held by the Thunderbolts. One of the most important features of long-range fighter escort is this relay system. Because of the differences in bomber speeds and the need of much weaving, fighters used up their gas. Thus, the same group of fighters could remain with the bombers only 25 to 40 minutes out of a six or eight hour mission, going and coming. And a thousand fighters might be needed to keep anything from 40 to 100 on the job at all times. While the enemy could strike with 250 at any point he selected, our fighter groups had to relieve at rendezvous points all along the route. But on the German side, the Luftwaffe was forewarned an hour and a half in advance even as our bombers gained altitude over England. This captured German film shows how quickly their 109s and Fock Wolf 190s got into action after a warning. They had plenty of time to mass their fighters at a chosen point of attack and to outnumber our escort at anything from 2 to 1 to 10 to 1. They were as grimly determined to stop our great daylight thrusts into their industrial heart as our bombers and fighters were resolved to press them home. Meanwhile, deep in Germany, the group of escorting Mustangs watches every corner of the sky, weaving ahead, above, below, and all around the bombers like a screen of destroyers protecting the main fleet. They don't have long to wait for another rendezvous, this time with the enemy. Blue leader here. Watch it, fellows. 109 to 10 o'clock. They get rid of their long-range wing tanks before the fight. Then down they go for the kill. With a touch of a finger on the stick, a camera and eight machine guns are put into action. Small cameras set on the wings make the record. Too often poor pictures due to gun vibration. But they let you see what happens in the instant of action as the pilot sees it. The enemy fighters are massing for an attack on our bombers, while our pilots watch every move of their varied tactics. You'll let it move like 
Looks like they're trying to land the wave the bomber. Great leader here. You're right. Here comes another nine o'clock. The Jerry's make a sneak attack on our bombers from behind. Gun camera film. Captured from the enemy. Reveals how they hammer our bombers with their 22 millimeters. A B-17 catches fire and goes down in flames. This one had half his tail shot off, but is still going ahead. We lose another, but they can't stop us. Our fighters, often heavily outnumbered, engage the enemy all over the sky. And this battle is only one of many. Day after day, month after month. Mustangs. Thunderbolts. Lightnings. Against the enemy 109s and the Bachwolf 190s. Our fighters attack, attack, attack. Two into ten. Six into fifty. They block the enemy's mass assaults until our victory column soars at the rate of four to one. If a missed rendezvous or other misadventure, due usually to blinding weather, prevented fighter protection somewhere, the bombers suffered heavy losses. But no American fighter ever failed them because of enemy odds, however great. Never was a mission turned back by enemy action. Increasing fleets of fortresses and liberators pressed onto their targets and dropped their loads. And the day arrived when a huge 8th Air Force bomber mission with full fighter escort was flown to Berlin and back without a challenge by a single enemy fighter. Before that eventful day, the Thunderbolts, Lightnings, and Mustangs had another mission to perform. Our bomber and fighter losses were strikingly less than the enemy's. But the home front sent us more bombers and fighters and more well-trained pilots, and our fleets grew mightier by the month. However, the enemy's first-line operational strength was maintained also. The Great Air Battle of Europe was still undecided. In February 1944, there was a sudden change. Our fighters were ordered to range wider, to seek the enemy in the air and on the ground instead of waiting for him, and above all, to follow him to his destruction. A gigantic fighter battle raged across the European skies with victories by our fighters alone of 60, 85, over 100 destroyed each day. The fight came down from almost invisible heights to the final decision, perhaps only a few feet above the ground. Enemy warplanes of every kind and in fantastic numbers were splashed all over the landscape of northwestern Germany and occupied Holland, Belgium, France. This was a crucial battle. Both sides were aware of the coming events with air domination itself at stake. Once again, a better cause, better planning and leadership, better equipment. And beyond everything else, the valor of our fighter pilots gave us victory. Only this time, it was decisive. So many of the enemy's aircraft exploded over his own forest and housetops or were driven flaming wrecks into the ground. So many of his famous fighter leaders met death at the hands of our pilots that his morale was shattered. His defense plan was smashed.
Quickly, our fighters seized their opportunity. Since the enemy did not come up to fight, down they went to blast his planes to pieces and burn them on his own airdromes all over Western Europe and in the very heart of Germany. It was the most savage and devastating fighter attack on record. Returning from unchallenged escort duty and on many special missions, they burned his aircraft by hundreds from one airfield to another. enemy flak, sheets of machine gun fire from flak towers and ground installations caused us heavy losses. Four times as many as the same number of fighters would sustain in aerial combat. But our fighters never flinched and by their courage faced destruction in single engine planes only a few feet above the ground and 500 miles from their bases until they had smashed the heavily concentrated frontline operational strength of the German Air Force forever. Now that the sky was ours, Another great opportunity became ours, too. The destruction of the enemy's transportation system that fed and supplied the great armies counted on to repel the Allied invasion forces. The enemy's roads and railroads were struck with the mighty force of air power. These were tense days, crucial days, and both sides knew it. Our fighters, freed by their bitterly won victory in the air, became a dominant factor on the ground. They exploded locomotives by the thousands and burned freight cars in uncounted numbers. No train in daylight hours was safe. No target too small. Even a single railroad car. No marshalling yard a haven. The enemy's desperately needed rail transport system was shattered all over the map. radar stations, trucks carrying ammunition and supplies, staff cars carrying high German officials. This one might have been Rommel. Road traffic of every kind and description until enemy convoys could only move effectively at night. 
What did this mean to the German armies of the West? How did it count on Invasion Day and the Battle of Normandy? The answer is history. Our gallant armies are driving ahead without having to keep one eye cocked over their shoulders. Their gun emplacements unobserved. Everywhere about the mighty battle was and is the flash of American fighters. The Germans see them deep in their own sky and cringe. Our men see them above the grim fight and cheer. There are remembered names in the mess halls. Major Gerald Johnson, a crack shot. Major Goodson, gallant fighter. Major Dwayne Beeson, great tactician. Captain Eugene O'Neill, one of the best. Major Don Gentile ran up a flaming record. Colonel Don Blakesley, great leader of fourth group. Major Walker Mahuran, one of the first and best of the great aces. Major Bob Johnson and all his victories. Lieutenant Colonel Gabreski with a great career. And Colonel Hubert Zemke, famous commander of 56. A score of victories or more on the records of them all. Duncan, Schilling, Pretty, and all our gallant fighter pilots who in the decisive hour smashed the Luftwaffe and gave us freedom of the air in Europe. Just as that freedom must now be gained in the Pacific. from the gun cameras of 8th Air Force fighter squadrons.
August 17, 1943, England. On the first anniversary of their operations against Fortress Europe, the 8th Bomber Command prepared 376 B-17s for the two most critical targets on their list, the ball bearing plants at Schweinfurt and the Messerschmitt Aircraft Factory at Regensburg, both deep in Germany. What an anniversary. Just a year ago, we flew that first mission to Rouen. 12 B-17s flying 56 miles to Tarkov. Now we were taking 376 fortresses 500 miles into Germany. Never had we prepared for so rough a mission. In 1943, the AAF was still growing up. The Luftwaffe had already reached its peak. But our boys taking their battle folders knew it. By the time we turned in our personal stuff, it was well understood that the projected doubleheader would bring on a large scale and costly air battle. In chapels all over England, most of the men turned to their ministers, rabbis, or priests. Getting into the trucks, we didn't dream that August 17th was being written into air history. Not only because of us, there were other soldiers in the skies. This was the same day that Sicily fell to the Allies. The same day that the RAF bombed Pinamunda, the B-2 rocket plant. The same day that General Kenny's B-25s destroyed 200 Jap planes at Wewak in eight minutes. And this day, our double mission involved the deepest penetration ever attempted into Germany and the largest bomber force to be dispatched to date. We knew that as we went further into Germany, we'd hurt her more. But we also knew we'd have to pay a higher price for admission. And now the last briefing as the pilots recheck the details of the mission with their crews. Individuals no longer existed. We were now 10-man teams, and on our teamwork would depend our success and perhaps our lives. Action against Schweinfurt got underway. The Regensburg task forces had just hit their target. A vast and intricate machine of destruction had been set in motion. Behind these modern warriors were weeks of high command planning. Now crewmen took care of routine duties. Ahead of us were four hours of rugged action. Our guns were going to be especially important today. At the briefing, they told us we'd have help from short-range fighters and eight their support mediums. The fighters were supposed to take us about halfway. The mediums were to bomb diversionary targets. But for the worst part of the trip, we'd be on our own. Finally, after a few hours delay due to bad weather, 2,300 men counted the seconds. American bombers had never been stopped. Although German defenses had stiffened, American formations had not been prevented from reaching their objectives once they responded to the green takeoff signal. As always, each thundering run was an epic of suspense until 30 tons of bombs, plane, and men were lifted from the earth.
the leader of the first wing, Colonel William Gross, swept in a huge circle around the field. Gradually, the second and third bombers edged into position. The sky quickly filled with stately fortresses sliding through space. But as soon as they got into formation over the British fields, they were picked up by German radar. Across the channel, the tentacles of the enemy's locator system, having touched the flying fortresses, now pinpointed them in space. Luftwaffe experts accurately plotted the American course, altitude and speed, and promptly informed their fighter control. Immediately, at dozens of Nazi airdromes from as far north as Denmark to down around Paris, German fighter units began to send up everything they had. Their order was, intercept and destroy the oncoming fortresses. The answer to the increasing Allied bomber offensive was this stepped up German fighter strength. Waves of opposition screamed off the map of Europe. In spite of the Luftwaffe, Allied planners selected our targets according to Allied Air Force priorities. That's why, merely three hours after the fourth bomb wing had paralyzed the Nazis' Messerschmitt factory at Regensburg, we and the first bomb wing were on our way to strike Schweinfurt in the face of an aroused enemy. As we began to run into flak, our gunners could feel the entire German Air Force warming up. Flying in enemy territory, we felt like goldfish in a bowl, waiting for the attack. Strict radio silence was maintained, while trained eyes searched the sky. savage blows since the war began. Jerry knocked 20 bombers out of the sky on the road to Schweinfurt. We never broke formation. Despite the ferocity of the attack, which extended all the way to and from the target, we pressed forward. Our guns kept burning the enemy out of the sky. Approaching the bomb run began the most critical defensive period. Now we divided into smaller groups, sacrificing our mutual defensive firepower to bomb the target most efficiently. The crucial moment, the moment around which the entire mission revolved, was now in the steady hands of our bombardiers. Each bomber was now committed. No more evasive action until bombs away. At this time, the formations were most vulnerable to attack. It didn't matter. We had to on Schweinfurt. We had 400 tons of high explosives to deliver.
after getting 80 hits on the two main ball bearing plants, we could defend ourselves again, at least to the extent of evasive action against flak and fighter attack. But the main idea now is to get home fast. At the British landing fields, word on the sky battle was out. Red flares were expected. That meant wounded aboard. These planes had priority at landing. Many of the fortresses themselves were crippled. A few came in with feathered props or with knocked out landing gear. After struggling home at housetop altitude, one B-17 with wounded aboard was committed to a crash landing. ship was my prayer. The anniversary battles lost us more men and aircraft in a single day than the 8th Bomber Command had lost in our first six months of operations over Europe. We who carried the war 500 miles to the enemy's industrial heart knew better than anyone how expensive it was. We had lost 60 bombers and their crews. What happened this 17th day of August, year 1943, was a testament to American men with modern weapons and a very old idea, fighting for freedom. On this day, high altitude bombers engaged in their greatest and, from the point of view of loss, their most disastrous air battle to date. Nonetheless, the results justified the price we paid. Out of these trials by fire, there did emerge from the struggle one of the most polished and powerful instruments of warfare ever assembled. This force of men and planes, this accumulation of skill and experience, became the power and might of the United States Air Force. from the gun cameras of the 8th Air Force Fighter Command operating against Nazi aircraft and ground targets. Italy. 
Seven months after surrendering to the Allies, Italian airfields resounded with growing American air might. From rebuilt Axis bases, the Allies were able to attack Nazi targets beyond the working range of bombers based in England. Out of the many sky battles, Allied air forces had gradually achieved air superiority. Now, theater air commanders, Generals Spots and Aker, arrived at Foggia to plan new strategy with General Nathan Twining, the 15th Air Force CG. Spots and Aker were handing Twining the biggest job his bombers had ever undertaken. The 15th Air Force soon got the news. They had been ordered to fly through Hitler's back door and destroy his oil industry. General Twining and his staff took on the job. Gentlemen, you have just received a directive to establish the target priority for the bomber offensive of the 15th Air Force. The decision has been announced. We will destroy oil refineries and synthetic oil plants. Now, Colonel Young, what does our intelligence show us in regard to these targets within our area? More than 50% of the refineries and synthetic plants producing gasoline for the Axis are within range of the 15th Air Force. Between 25 and 30% of the total Axis production of gasoline is represented by the 10 large refineries around Floeste. While these refineries were seriously damaged in the attack last August by the task force operating from Egypt, Recent photo reconnaissance reveals that, with one exception, all refineries are currently operating at full capacity. General Newbert Farm, it's a big job we've got ahead of it. He's knocked out a Palestine means the Germans will be supplied of one third of his oil resources. We bomber boys who moved up from Africa started the Palestine air siege. On the morning of April 5th, 94, B-17 swung into formation. Close by were 136 B-24s. We were strong. We expected the enemy's coastal radar network in Albania and Yugoslavia to spot us as we made our approach over the Adriatic Sea. Although it was still early in our 600-mile run to target, we got into flak suits. They're a kind of insurance. Climbing to altitude, we skimmed the Yugoslav mountains. Mighty peaceful peaceful until they bristled with flak guns. We were soon to find out the hard way that Ploesti had become the third best defended spot on the continent. a high altitude mission, 21 to 24,000 feet. As we neared the target, we edged into tighter formations. Each had top cover. We all remembered a 1943 Ploesti mission with 177 liberators in which we lost 54 planes. Would this be like last year's mission? This one might be worse. 250 enemy fighters, outnumbering ours three to one, attacked. time we crossed the Sofia Belgrade line, our lightnings moved in for the knockout punch. Then we ran into flak. 256 heavy guns filled the sky with black, deadly mushrooms. Yeah. 
immense flak, the enemy had added smoke. We could almost smell the nauseating acid fog. 2,000 smoke pots effectively covered Ploesti. Accurate visual bombing was impossible. At headquarters, they knew something had to be done. After many missions, the target was still effectively protected. On 10 June, operations decided on a new tactic. We're going to dive bomb Romano Americano tomorrow using P-38. altitude and some of us dumped our wing tanks as we got close to the enemy. German fighter units on the ground. Our P-38s got through the smoke. The mission was successful. We had destroyed 29 enemy planes and had damaged three refineries. But the job wasn't done. Operations increased. Servicing went around the clock. The plan called for the bombers to be on target during the morning hours and stop Ploesti's working day. Now they prepared for 600 plane missions. They tried new electronic devices for blind bombing. Everyone hoped the sheer concentrated weight of tonnage would crack German and Romanian defenses. Ploesti sort of got under everyone's skin. After hitting it from the air, the flyers rehashed it on the ground. The men ate it, slept it, cursed it, especially the flak and smoke. The four-month campaign since April had cost 1,900 men, the crews of 189 bombers and 41 fighters. Early in August, General Twining called a meeting of our group commanders. I've called you in today to discuss future air operations against Westing oil refinery. The Strategic Air Force, during the next three days, will attack continuously, night and day, with maximum effort against all primaries in the area. We got over Ploesti, all right, but the enemy gave us a warm welcome. They rammed up more than 45,000 rounds of flak. That didn't stop us. During three days of smoky air siege, we lost 30 more planes, 23 to flak. But now we had over a hundred Mustangs as escorts. The enemy jabbed and our 51 swooped into the battle. Hit hard, enemy fighter strength fell apart. Displaying courage far beyond the call of duty, our boys drove the enemy into the ground. Black kept our bomber crews on their toes. We waded through it all the way to the target. The full weight of our attack fell on Poesti. That did it. Steady pounding whittled away 90% of Romanian oil production. The global and greedy designs of an Axis dictator were consumed in a blazing, oily ploesti. This was the crowning climax to our air siege. 
In only five months, this had become the graveyard for one-third of Hitler's oil. Oil, a pre-war weak point in the Nazi military supply system, became a bottleneck under repeated Allied blows. The bombs had crushed gasoline producing, storage and shipping centers. Vainly, Germany's 350,000 slave workers tried to repair the damage. But now all the refineries in the rich Ploesti cluster were damaged or knocked out. We hurt them, but they hurt us too. The Ploesti campaign had cost us 270 heavy bombers, 49 fighters and their crews. Each plane and each man helped to shorten the war. As we hit the donut line, we were still flying the mission and we wondered about our missing air crews. How many would come back? The answer came sooner than we had expected. Twelve days after the last bombing of Ploesti, we got a real thrill. An airlift of 56 transport converted B-17s were bringing back our buddies who had been forced down. Romania had surrendered to the Russians. In just three days, more than 1,100 returned as part of Operation Reunion. This was the first mass prisoners of war liberation. Of the first 600, only 10 were stretcher cases. All in all, considering what they'd been through, they were a light-hearted bunch. It was good to be back. Yes, it was a day to remember, that day at Foggia Airport. These were the first, and General Twining made it plain how glad he was to have his men back. He had planned something special. From his Coral Sea experience, he remembered what privation meant. First, he gave his men medical care and food. Then, Godspeed on their next mission. Their new checkpoint was the Statue of Liberty. Their target was home. The 15th Air Force, by burning Ploesti off the target list, did more than merely destroy enemy oil production. They brought eventual disaster at compounded interest. The German war machine was stalled for lack of fuel. Later chapters will show Allied air power accurately blasting the vitals of the Axis with the hard-won bombing experience of the United States Air Force. Oh. On 13th February at dusk, RAF Lancasters wing their way toward Dresden in a massive blow involving more than 800 heavy bombers. A new type of German scarecrow bomb explodes in midair, simulating a direct hit on a bomber. Pathfinder flares and incendiaries mark the immediate targets. Scarecrow bomb. The attack is in support of Russian armies moving toward this rail center on a front 50 miles away. Two thousand six hundred and fifty tons of bombs are dropped during the night attack. Two days later, AAF flying fortresses follow up with a second assault on this German communication center. Twenty-five tons of explosives are aimed at what remains of the freight yards. Prior to the war, Dresden was a city of 625,000 population. The double blow is estimated to have virtually destroyed the entire city. planes over enemy territory on 22nd February, a typical day of all-out Allied bombing. The RAF bombs highways and viaducts. Every type of RAF combat plane is used in this onslaught on German transport troops and communications.
1900 heavy bombers from the 8th and 15th Air Force Group strike at rail targets. Rocket firing typhoons peel off to strike at enemy installations and supplies. sorties are made and more than 6,600 tons of explosives are dropped during this single day of all-out bombing and strafing. On 23rd February, the following night, the German industrial city of Pforzheim is hit by more than 400 RAF bombers. Using a new bombing technique, the Lancasters lay some 10,000 four-pound incendiaries to mark the target. Then, they drop everything from 500 to 12,000 pound blockbusters. In 20 minutes, the raid is over. The town of Fortsheim is completely destroyed. On 2nd March, 700 Lancaster and Halifax bombers roar over Cologne to block roads and railroads leading across the Rhine and to destroy concentrations of German troops fleeing the city as the American First Army smashes into it. Three thousand tons of bombs hit the city, once fourth largest in Germany, now a pile of rubble and shattered buildings. A German scarecrow bomb demolishes a Lancaster. Strategic targets are hit without destroying the Cologne Cathedral, which still stands amid the ruins.